Yeah, um, probably not as stringent a one as I would. I am used to. I came from the states where we had training tables, and on the training table, what that meant was, um, you know, we we controlled and we were able to monitor and put in everything the athletes took while because they lived in residence halls. They got to eat off the training table for free. In the United States. Yeah, here it's much different in the Canadian universities, or at least in this university in particular. Um, the only role we take is uh, we let allow them to have access to a dietitian and a nutritionist on campus as part of as part of our program as, of the uh, uh, training the entire student. We have the physical performance, the mental performance, and this goes under that health. Mm -hmm. I, I know we're creating high performance machines. High performance machines need fuel. Right, and so the value of the diet is, you know, the right fuel results in the right performance. Um, we're trying to also, I mean, that's from the high performance point of view, just from a regular, what the role of athletics is, it's to create great lifestyle habits, choices, right? So there's the value in that as well. Um, to me, you know, if we're doing our job right, we're creating good habits that last a lifetime. We're educating students on the value of, of what proteins, what carbohydrates, you know, in order to get the best out of them. Okay, so it's beyond obvious. It's beyond obviously the the sport itself. Oh yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and so nobody's here is turning into a professional athlete. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So the access to the nutritionist. Mm -hmm. There's no guidelines that say if you join a sport team that say that you need to eat this, you need to no. maintain this amount of weight, no. or you need to do all this and that. No, 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 no. Um, not from a department wide. Now individual coaches may have different um, parameters. Um, you know, they do their physical fitness testing and they may come in and this guy's benching 120 and he only weighs 135. And so a coach may set a goal of you've got to get your strength to this and we need you to put on seven pounds of muscle. And that's a normal procedure. Yeah, that would be normal. Things. Yeah. Is, do you think, is that the case of Ryerson then with some, I don't know, can't, from the coach's perspective, but... Um, right. I can't say. I imagine that it must be, a, you know, it depends. I, I don't know if, I mean, badminton most likely not, but ice hockey, definitely so. We don't have football, right? So. That's normally where those sorts of things happen, but I could imagine it would happen in the basketball, and where you have a post player that needs to be big and strong. So, mm, but that's more geared towards like uh, weight levels, and maybe yeah. not so much for eating. Maybe it does. There's a well, it would, aspect yeah. to it. I mean, that would be an aspect of it because we don't say put on seven pounds of muscle. We, you know, we send them talk to the nutritionist that's here, right, and then also talk to our strength and conditioning coach, so they would work together. You know, we don't. We're not. A, we don't promote supplements. Don't drink supplements. Mm -hmm. Put on weights. No, that's oh, not okay. what we're about. Interesting. Okay. There's, there's just not enough um, jury out on how those things affect and and interact. So we're a little we're a little cautious and hesitant. Okay. Um, do you think there'd be a benefit in having at least towards the sports program at least the results of having the university uh, monitor and regulate what the students eat, or well, is that not fair? To me, if, if for an athletic point of view, I mean, yeah, I would love it. I mean, it comes down to the resources, though. Um, mm -hmm. We want to be able to, um, athletes come back after studying and training, and they don't always get a good meal. They'll put in a, a TV dinner, right? Some athletes, because they're training and working and studying here, they don't have time to, to, to buy the foods they need. I mean, do you buy fresh fruit? Do you see the price of fresh fruit in the winter? So the athlete will forego fresh fruit, even though they need those essential vitamins, Interesting. right? Okay. And so the benefit of having a training table, we'll call it, where we control the resources, where we provide the food for them, to me, it's, it's tremendous. We can monitor. But again, that speaks to high level, high functioning athleticism. Yeah, and that can happen here. But again, we would have to have a significant paradigm shift in the culture of athletics ah, okay. in this country. Realistically, do you think it's possible? Maybe it, I mean, fire some of this? You know what? Um, I think anything's possible. It's just somebody choosing that's what's that's where they want to put the money in. Um, the OUA would have, we have rules about what we can provide to athletes right oh, now, okay. right? And so those rules include a thirty-five hundred dollars scholarship. That's it. If we provided meal plans, those would be gifts in kind of these scholarships, and those would be above and beyond, and so would be in violation. So it's not just a matter of the university making that change. You would have to look at the policies and procedures that govern university athletics in this country and in this province as well. Okay. So I guess with that idea, it wouldn't be, it'd be almost uh, absurd to think that another university would be doing those above and beyond things. I think it would be, um, it'd be frowned upon because, you know. It'd be frowned upon, but it's not, it's not, it's not. 
banned or it's not. You're not well, it'd be a violation it. of the OUA rules. It would be okay. Right, because those things can't happen, and so somebody would probably, to use a better better word, rat them out to the OUA. Then there'd be sanctions and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so it's not unlikely that you know the yeah. team would be having. Some yeah, it's the same as if we give an athlete a sweatshirt, you know. Um, a uh, fifty dollar gift, gift. Yeah, yeah, right. Gift. Same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but uh, okay. I'll, well, then hypothetically, then speaking, then if this kind of practice of like, say, U of T was like providing its uh, rowing team with like its own like meal hall, mm -hmm. just an example, something like that. Yeah. I mean, would that be fair to the competition, or it would be an OUA violation? Yeah. And so that wouldn't be fair because now all of a sudden. U of T has an advantage. They can go and get the best roars, right? Wherever, if you're a roar and you're really good and you know, hey, you spend $400 a month on food and groceries. You don't have to do that here. We'll pay for you, right? Well, I'm going to go there. That's saving me $4,000 a year in school supplies. I'm going to go there. So that's where the unfair advantage comes in. Now, another unfair advantage is now their athletes are better primed, better fueled. They don't have to worry about cooking is taking an extra hour to do meals. Maybe they get to train more. Maybe they get to, you know, hang out more as a team. So now there's all those ancillary benefits that are happening. It's not just the money they save, but now it's the performance gains, the, 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 the extra time spent training, the extra time spent doing mental conditioning. Now you get a significant advantage.